I'm very pleased to announce our third speaker who will give his talk in person, Paul Debar. Paul is CEO and co-founder of Bohr Quantum Technology. He's also a distinguished visiting fellow at Columbia University. <laughs> Paul is the former Under Secretary for Science, U.S. Department of Energy. Um, Bohr Technology focuses on developing networking technologies for the emerging quantum internet. Um, now, uh, prior to starting Bohr, when Paul was at uh, was the Under Secretary for Science, he uh, led the department's efforts in fundamental energy science and commercialization of technologies. And in this role, he managed 65,000 people, and he was responsible, or he led the deployment of uh, about 15 billion dollars in funding to a large number of uh, national labs and universities that uh, form the research infrastructure of this nation. Um, he's on the board of the Chicago-based Power and Digital Infrastructure Corporation and is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I will add um, uh, that Paul uh, was a central and integrating figure who has helped get the national engine going in the direction of quantum information science and technology. Uh, so with that, uh, over to you, Paul. Thanks. All right, uh, Supratic, thank you for uh, that introduction. David, thanks for having me here. Uh, there's been a I see a lot of uh, friends here uh, who I've known for years, uh, especially at the University of Chicago and, and Argonne and Fermi National Lab, so it's great to be here. And uh, David and team have had a, a great run of people over the last few years. You've had Hartmut Nevin and uh, Dario Gill from IBM, uh, both NSF uh, directors, I think, over the last, uh, the last few years, uh, congressman, head of QIS for DOD, NIST. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm honored to, to be a speaker uh, this year. Um, uh, this has been an extremely busy year in quantum space, in particular the last five months uh, in dealing with fundraising. And I'm going to spend most of my talk about what's happened here in the last 12 months and what's happened from a, an investment and a capital raising point of view, uh, because it's been quite amazing. Before I go into that, I'd like to give a few comments about the University of Chicago, its culture, its foundation of the Chicago Quantum Exchange, and its ability to be a leader in discovery and innovation. Uh, a core requirement to be at the cutting edge of creativity and having the ability to support people who are non-conformists in regards to the current thinking on a topic. This requires nurturing free minds and free spirits on the topics as wide as economics, medicine, the laws of the universe, and applied technologies like quantum. Uh, and having free minds in turn requires a spirit of tolerance for others' ideas and the ability to nurture free minds and tolerance uh, for those free ideas is a core mission of a university, a lab, uh, and, uh, and obviously a core mission of this university. Uh, with the leadership of Chancellor Zimmer and President Avalados, has imprinted this historical mission into the current day wording in the development of the Chicago Principles, whose defense and support of free and open inquiry and debate has not only made an impact on discovery and innovation here, including in quantum, but it also has had an impact on academia across the United States. Well, since last year's uh, CQE uh, annual conference, momentum has continued to grow for quantum science and technologies. I remembered very well, with David and others, to the first White House event several years ago, when I heard someone, over say, uh, 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 someone say that we should prepare for the day that the momentum for quantum starts to fall. And I frankly thought that was quite strange to hear at the first White House conference that people were already starting to worry about momentum. And uh, I think uh, that worry of that person who brought that up at that first White House uh, conference several years ago turned out to be wrong. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Charlie Tahan, who spoke here previously on his continued leadership, and another example 
is uh, former Secretary Penny Pritzker, who's joined the White House Advisory Council on Science and Technology, and her support for QIS uh, is, has been very helpful in the Chicago community. Uh, I think is also uh, uh, the, uh, Paul said uh, here at the beginning about the length of time it took to get to where we were here. Uh, Victor Hugo said, uh, there's nothing more powerful than an idea who has come. And in this case, as Paul mentioned, uh, it took 100 years from the theoretician work from Planck, Einstein, and Bohr uh, to hit applied prospects. But that's okay. Uh, it took about the same time for Einstein's gravitational wave theory to be proven by Caltech uh, experimentalists. So I think we're kind of on track with the, the other Einstein efforts that uh, happened 100 years ago. Uh, as we've seen a, a, a large run in the last few years around quantum investment, uh, a quintupling of the DOE budget for quantum uh, in the last few years, the National Photonic Initiative, which people here in this room pioneered, uh, was embraced by the political leadership in DC, in Congress and the executive branch, and I consider myself as a as uh, someone that, uh, that uh, the National Photonic Initiative was able to help, help move along uh, in the last few years. Uh, the testimony on the proposed National Quantum Initiative Act in Congress, uh, which was very entertaining. Uh, I, myself and several others testified to the Senate uh, on superposition, entanglement, and bipolar cats. Uh, I saw quite a bit of bipartisanship in Congress that day of mild confusion, uh, and that was uh, a certain, certainly a highlight of mine uh, in front of the Senate during my years. Uh, then we saw the execution of the NQI, which many people have been talking about here today. The NSF awarded their centers to several universities. NIST stood up uh, the, the, the Quantum Economic Development Consortium and DOE awarded its five NQI centers, uh, including two right here in Chicagoland, including uh, 69 participants. I see the two leaders here uh, from the two, uh, the two here in the Chicago area from Argonne and Fermi. Uh, and uh, the 69 participants included uh, from national labs, academia, and the private sector, including names like IBM, Rigetti, and even Goldman Sachs, which I found entertaining. Uh, my favorite comment I got was from someone right here at the university who mostly jokingly said, it was great that we won two of the NQI centers, why didn't we get all five? So, <laughs> um, which brings us to this last year uh, since uh, the, C the last CQE conference. Uh, so here, here's some of the highlights of what's happened uh, in the last year. The number of quantum computing companies continues to grow significantly. Last count I saw was 193. So there's plenty of, plenty of them out there now. Uh, noticeable announcements on the accomplishment of QC companies, inc including Google and IBM, in chip qubit numbers and, and error rates. Uh, major accomplishments by CQE member entities, including uh, winning the NSF uh, Quantum Biosensing Center, uh, um, uh, efforts in photonic chip design, uh, new quantum materials, uh, as was mentioned, the Polsky Center Duality uh, Quantum Accelerator, uh, quantum networks at Argonne, uh, uh, quantum network work at Fermilab and Caltech. Uh, I think the most entertaining piece I got out of all that was uh, in December after the Fermilab Caltech announcement in which there was an article by marketwatch.com about the paper. Uh, in which it talked about a future quantum exchange traded fund to invest into quantum companies. That was my favorite one from last December. Uh, that would be targeting investing in multiple private quantum tech companies. I read that last December and I thought, wow, this guy's a little bit too enthusiastic. Um, uh, this is a long way off before we're gonna have uh, exchange traded funds and investing across multiple private quantum companies. Uh, and I turned out to be quite wrong. Uh, and I'll talk further about that, that's, that, that's happened. Um, uh, another major highlight this year was further large increases in federal R&D funding, including quantum that was proposed. 
And uh, as I was alluding to, finally, in my opinion, the most surprising advance in the last 12 months was the capital fundraising events, the private capital fundraising events that have occurred over the last five months that I, that I will go through. So let me turn a little bit to my slides here. Uh, I'll first start off in the public sector of what's happened here in the last, uh, last 12 months. Uh, so when I was undersecretary, I spent a lot of time with a lot of members of Congress, but one of them was Senator Schumer. Uh, it could be because Brookhaven was in his state, but I'm certain there were other reasons. Actually, one of the things about Senator Schumer, who was very positive, was that he, uh, when I met with him many times, first time I met with him, uh, one off, uh, he talked about how he studied chemistry at Harvard. And I did not know that about Senator Schumer, that that's actually, he had a bit of a science background before he went into law, law and politics. And he became very engaged uh, about the topics that at least I was personally involved with, which was R&D discovery and how to commercialize. And I would, one time I talked two hours with him just about those two topics. And, uh, and as a part of that, it became very clear that he was beginning to draft a law, which I think as many of you know, called the, the, the Endless Frontiers Act. Um, and I, I was part of that dialogue uh, as, as he and then his staff were, were drafting that up. Uh, I think, as you know, uh, that, that act uh, was proposed by Senator Schumer and Senator Young uh, from Indiana, uh, and then it, it ended up getting merged into a broader uh, science effort that Charlie Tan had also kind of uh, talked about that included other aspects like uh, traditional microelectronics and, you know, chips and, and so on. Uh, so uh, uh, the current version of the bill is kind of, you know, and I'll get to the House version here in a quick second. I'll uh, go through what's going on, uh, on on the two kind of big government efforts. Um, you know, it is uh, primarily an NSF-focused uh, bill. Uh, DOE was added into it. Um, uh, but it is still, and you can see here on the dollar amounts, it's still you know, primarily an NS NSF-funded effort. For those of you who may not have followed it all, the, the Endless Frontiers Act slash the USICA, that's the, little, the acronym for the, the name now, um, focuses on the U.S. government should be, should be trying to help develop 10 industries of the future, right? So it's kind of, it's farther down the TRL level from basic discovery into let's try to get some applications, but on really kind of cutting edge kind of topics. Um, and so the 10 areas, I don't remember all of them, but they include quantum, uh, high performance computers, semiconductors, some bio work, energy, a few other things, obviously. And so that's kind of hardwired into the draft of this bill, which is sitting, sitting in the Senate. And uh, NSF would be standing up centers. So I think uh, one of the things I commented on people here in the room, people looked at what we did on the quantum centers and have replicated it and tried to move it over to NSF. Um, and so uh, the, the successes that people here in this room have done about how these centers were, were bid out and stood up and so on have, have become a, an example. And this is the exact example um, that people are trying to copy off of. Uh, DOE would also have some. Uh, this is, at least in this crowd, a little bit more DOE-centric uh, because of national labs and national lab funding. Uh, it, uh, it certainly has DOE funding. Uh, but it is lesser and it's backward ended. So the first year is only a billion dollars divided by 10 industries of the future d doesn't give you a lot. So, so that's a little bit of a downside uh, to this current bill and, uh, and at least a lot of people in this room. Once again, NSF's great and NSF would have a lot of ability to go uh, fund that, but that's the kind of the current effort. There's not much line itemed. And for those of you who kind of know that, what that term means uh, from a government point of view, line item means Congress telling the agency that they have to go spend it on X, whatever X is. There's not much line itemed here, meaning there's a lot of flexibility with NSF and DOE to go fund energy or high performance computers or semiconductors or, or biosecurity uh, because they don't, they don't exactly say you must go spend a tenth of it in quantum, right? So uh, there's a bit of uncertainty around this. There's a lot of money, more NSF, a little bit more uncertainty about where it is. 
less for DOE uh, as, uh, as, uh, you know, as, as kind of proposed. Now, the House version uh, is, not, is not very, it structurally is quite a bit different than the Senate version. Um, it is more of a traditional proposal. There's an NSF bill, which I'm not gonna go through. I'll go through the DOE bill, which has a lot more quantum line items in it. There are two bills that many of you have been, uh, uh, been involved with, uh, as well as the, uh, a lot of the private sector community, especially on section 404, uh, which is called the Quest Act, and that's the quantum computing section. These bills were proposed and got incorporated into bills that were passed unanimously out of the House Science Committee and widely passed by the House floor. So the House is way behind the overall NSF and DOE bills, and as a result, these particular sections. These items are much more robust and line item for quantum, okay, than USICA and the Senate version. Um, so you can see here that on uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the quantum uh, computing side, which it dealt a lot with uh, uh, Google and IBM and others on this, Rigetti, uh, would inject uh, $340 million for DOE to go buy cycle time on quantum computer, cloud quantum computers that are, have been built or being built by the private sector, aka, you know, Rigetti and Cyquantum and, you know, uh, IonQ and, and, and so on. Uh, and then uh, through a grant process, give uh, cycle time to researchers to use that uh, cloud quantum computing space. There's a lot of advantages to this. Obviously, we help out the community by people getting effectively free cycle time on QCs, uh, driven by science. So a lot of it will be quantum materials and biology and chemistry and so on, which I think is probably the first use cases for QCs. Um, it also, frankly, injects money into the quantum computing companies. Now they're getting revenues. Uh, is de de developing their business, they'll probably go build more, right? They'll actually go build some more QCs because they're, they're actually selling, you know, they're generating revenues, right? And it's the federal government that's buying uh, cycle time. The second one is on, on quantum networking. And uh, there's a quantum networking bill uh, that, uh, that, uh, that injects $100 million a year for the next five years, so $500 million in line item, that's not for really for research, that's for construction. Uh, and it's a little bit mushy to kind of go back and forth between research and construction, but take that quick, kind of quickly aside. Um, the NQI centers are very much more focused on, on research and development of technologies. This is a separate focal er focus area, which is let's go build some stuff. And at $100 million a year, I think for many of you know the the federal government actually authorized $25 million in the current fiscal year. It doesn't get you very far to build quantum networks, but it, it was a start, and that's kind of how you do things in Washington. You start small, and then you try to build momentum. Uh, and this would be momentum, right? Jumping from 25 over a few years to 100 every year uh, would, would, uh, would, would really kind of jump uh, you know, this from ARPANET to NSFNET uh, using the references to the original internet uh, where there were incremental nodes added uh, with a lot of NSF money at the time. Uh, the quantum networks in this country would get a giant jump uh, if that bill gets passed. Uh, and now I'll jump to the private sector, the one that really surprises me. Uh, and uh, it's real, it's funded. <laughs> Okay, so what I, just, what I just went through was proposals. This is actually cash in the bank. So in the last five, year, uh, five months, uh, and I was joking about the Fermilab, MarketWatch, you know, Fermilab, Caltech, MarketWatch.com joke, right? It's not a joke. It actually, this happened, okay? And so uh, starting off with IonQ, um, there's a, an investment vehicle called a SPAC, I won't, drive into finance too much, but there was a SPAC, which is basically an IPO vehicle. So if you just think about it as an, as an, as an IPO is a better way of doing it without getting into uh, too, much, too much finance here. Um, uh, a SPAC came along, that effectively the IPO, it's closed, and it, IonQ raised $650 million in cash to go do their work at a $2 billion valuation. It kind of stunned everybody, right, when that came along, right, in May. 
and um, put it into context. The whole DOE budget under the National Quantum Initiative for the five years, for the five centers I talked about earlier, is $625 million. IonQ raised more money than the whole of the DOE NQI effort, just for themselves. Okay, so just put that into context, right? And I think that really surprised a lot of people, and it's traded okay. Uh, since it's uh, finished, it's kind of gone up and down. Uh, well, more, it has less to do with IonQ than it has to do with SPAC trading. So followed on that, there was a private round by PsyQuantum, which is a photonic quantum computer company, uh, raising $450 million at a $3.1, $5 billion valuation. I'll jump to Rigetti. Uh, Rigetti just did a round at a $1.5 billion valuation, raising $458 million. Uh, and, uh, and there's a prospect of a, a spin out of Google X called Sandbox, which isn't very public about exactly what it's doing. It, it's not uh, Hartmut's group, it's not the quantum computing group, it's a separate group. Um, uh, and, and they're, they're out uh, kind of interested in, in raising, uh, and raising money for non-kind non of QC-related quantum topics. Uh, on top of that, much less visible, um, you know, i.e. not public, uh, are you know, the big behemoths of, <laughs> of, of what's out there in terms of money. And they're raising, and they're internally funding, uh, so it's not public how much, how much they're raising, but you can probably guess that the likes of IBM, Google, and AWS uh, are putting actually far more money into what they're doing than what I just described. So uh, there's been you know, quite a bit uh, that's happened here uh, as, of, uh, as of late. Um, uh, uh, so that's, I think that's the last one. Um, so uh, I have a few thoughts about what has, be, has begun to, to work, so to speak, in terms of startups and raising money uh, in the quantum space. And there's basically, what I just kind of went through with you a, a little bit, is that there's kind of been three primary business models that quantum technology companies have executed on. One is a large company which has a long history in QIS ramps up quantum spending, and, and the example for that is IBM. Right, they've been doing this for this. They've been dealing with uh, quantum for a long time, uh, and they just decided, okay, we're just going to take internal money and charge forward. So that's one kind of business model. The second one is buying out a research group. Okay, and so uh, if there's a kind of a core technology at a particular university or a lab, it's really been universities that where this has happened at, uh, and uh, a big company comes along and says, we're hiring everybody. And you go to the university and you negotiate a deal with them and you take everybody out and you move them over, right? And obviously the historical example of that has been Google and U University of Santa Barbara, uh, and more recently AWS and at Caltech. The last one is the one that most people think about for startups, which is really uh, a, uh, a spin out of, uh, of a small group of researchers, entrepreneurial, to start their own company um, uh, that may come out of a lab or, or come out of a university. And the examples of that in the quantum space are, are the likes of, uh, of IonQ and PsyQuantum and, and Rigetti. So what are some of the takeaways of what's just happened here uh, in the last few months? Uh, first of all, there's a lot of jobs. Uh, I think as you know, Matt's here. But if you're if you're producing a lot of uh, students, uh, graduates, uh, undergrads, grad students who are graduating, and you're wondering where they're going to go work, plenty of students here. Uh, that cash has to be spent somewhere, and uh, certainly uh, certainly a lot of it's going into lab facilities, but a lot of it's going into people. And uh, so uh, there's going to be, as a result of what's happened in the last five months. Uh, the acceleration of people, and uh, if, if, you run a, if you run a lab, uh, congratulations, your cost of keeping people in your, in your current lab is probably going up. You're probably having fun conversations about that, but net, net, that's, a, that's a positive. I mean, you know, we're seeing the pull, right, uh, that's going on. There's some challenges for people here in the room on that, but that is what it is. The next thing, the next major takeaway is something we should all be a little I think everyone here should be a little cautious about is the promises that have been made by those companies to their investors. Okay, 
Uh, in general, what people have been saying is, don't worry, three years from now, we'll have a quantum advantage computer. Okay, that's like the standard thing that's been said for the last five months. Um, and so, three years from now, if, they, if these companies don't hit some sort of quantum advantage commercial deployable technology, uh, the investors are going to start going, you, you didn't hit what you did, you know, what you, you, know, what you promised. Uh, and, um, you know, that happens in the venture world. And by the way, it's okay if some fail and some succeed, but if none of them hit this three-year general point that they're making, um, it's going to cause a big retraction and in interest in this sector by, by the private. That, happened, that happens in the venture world. The big one was in the energy sector in venture capital in the mid-2000s when bioenergy became really a hot topic. All the venture capital firms ran into bioenergy and it basically didn't work very well. And then the venture community said energy is horrible. And it took a long time for the venture world to come back to energy as a result of that failure. So, uh, given all this and a large capital wave of private capital, um, it does also have a couple of downsides. Uh, one of them is uh, that uh, critical mass of companies and efforts are beginning to grow. Okay? Uh, if you're a startup, if you're trying to create a technology, you, you now have Cyquantum with an extra 430 whatever million dollars of effort. Uh, you got Rigetti with a lot of money. You got, you know, you got I IBM and Google who've convinced the parent companies to put a lot more money into it. Um, and so if you're, you know, so these kind of constellations, right, are growing. I'm not great HEP, whatever. Okay, everyone kind of gets that. But the, 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 the uh, you know, they're, and they're starting to suck in people. They're, and they got the money to get things done. And so... It's generally a good thing, but you need to think about it as uh, the competition for people and ideas and technologies ultimately at the end of the day are starting, the, all, this, all this kind of you know, concentrations of I was just describing that are going on at Berkeley and Pasadena and Santa Barbara and whatnot are getting stronger than they were just a few months ago, given what's going on. So if you're in this space, you got to need to think very carefully about, you know, hey, it's great. There's a lot of money, a lot of things going on, a lot of accomplishments, but uh, you know, times times not on your side anymore, right? In terms of uh, a lot of these different topics, given given the additional resources. So overall, it's been extremely positive. Twelve months, uh, as I said, more positive than I expected. Uh, I certainly hope. Uh, my, my prediction, I think one of the congressional bills will get passed. It'll probably be a mixture of them. Uh, I would certainly advocate for the House science version in terms of the quantum topics uh, for the reasons that you probably saw, saw me discuss. Um, my best guess is they'll get around to it a year from now uh, before the end of a congressional session. That's, it's highly uncontroversial. Uh, you know, and, and, and we were able to get science and tech spending up a lot in the last four years for people who, who've been following. There's more, more support and momentum for that. And I, I, I expect that uh, at the end of a congressional se session after an election, when uh, a lot of the, the, the hot view of politics kind of falls away, that's when the non-controversial laws actually can get pushed through, like the Energy Policy Act of 2020 happened right after the end of the last election. So that's kind of the, the summary of what I've seen uh, for the last, uh, last 12 months, and uh, glad to take any questions. When you say quantum advantage, and you did say a commercially viable product, but could you just expand on that, what the metric would be? Yeah, so uh, I think several people have talked about, I remember Charlie talking about this, you know, you, you need to have uh, a system, and so QC is, a, is actually a system, there are other, other, other technology areas, that, that actually provides a solution to a client, a customer, a user, okay? 
And so I think a lot of people, especially in the QC space, are trying to figure out what that first application is, right? Uh, that, could, that, could, that could work on it. Um, uh, and so lots of people are trying to figure that out. My personal opinion, and I kind of made reference to, to, to it earlier, um, because of the, effectively, the, the architecture of quantum mechanics within, within a QC system, the likely first easiest use case is modeling quantum systems, as I was talking about in materials or chemistry or biology. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, the science community could be the first use case rather than financial institutions um, and or, or other, other areas. I have a personal view of this, which is, um, uh, uh, you know, given, given some of the NISC challenges around coming up with solutions, uh, that rather than having uh, first, first use cases uh, for uh, quantum microprocessors may not be a standalone quantum computer. It actually may be an accelerator as part of a hybrid HPC architecture in which the front end of uh, a, uh, a, a heterogeneous HPC could be uh, a NISC accelerator that could narrow down the questions much faster that could then be fed into the traditional GPU, CPU architecture and speed that up. Um, I think that because you kind of get through this kind of NISC issue a little bit when you, when you kind of have this layer of accuracy that with traditional digital could possibly be used. Um, uh, there's been some debate on this. Uh, I'm no longer undersecretary, so I don't know exactly how far this has gotten. Uh, but I think that that's, that's something that's, uh, and that could help, you know, it's not a pure quantum advantage, but it's something in which there is uh, an advantage of that HPC architecture above traditional uh, GPU, CPU architecture. Any other questions for Paul? Great talk, Paul. I was just wondering if you would be able to share, to the extent you can, what your new company is working on. Yeah, so there was a bit of conversations with the Dutch and Charlie and whatnot on, on networking. You know, at, at, the end, at the end of the day, um, as, uh, once again, many people here in this room worked on, on the quantum internet blueprint, um, uh, there, there are three use cases uh, that we mapped out a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, here uh, and and the rest uh, rest are participated in that. There's uh, there's a security applications. Uh, there is uh, moving quantum data, which is kind of thought about as quantum computing networking, uh, and um, and but it could be sensing data also, right? Um, and then there's more efficient data distribution, and there's uh, certainly potential for. Uh, certain types of classical data that could that could move uh, more efficiently within within quantum networks. Most people talk about security, uh, uh, but there are the challenge around quantum networking is actually the scope of applications is is really broad, and so how do you narrow first first use cases? So back to the systems point, you need to try to provide a solution to somebody, and. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, there's kind of two business models in general for tech. You could either be a component provider or the system, right? And you could be a system provider and obviously make some of the components. It's okay to be a component provider as long as you're working with someone who has a system that's going to deliver, in this case, a networking solution to somebody that has value for one of those use cases. And uh, so, um, you know, one of the things that, 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 that we've been very much thinking about is what's that first use case, right? Because you need that first use case uh, and you gotta pick it out after all of that and how to create a system, either yourself or working with someone to create a system that provides some sort of solution. And so that's what, that's what we've been working on is to try to, how, how do you narrow that down to what's the first use case, who's the right customer, Right, and uh, within that horribly broad, you know, scope 
that, uh, that is a possibility, which ultimately is a very positive thing, but you have to take a first step, so you have to kind of pick on something. Let's take one last question from the remote uh, audience. Okay, from our remote audience. What is the biggest challenge for someone launching a startup company in the quantum information science field today? Yeah, uh, I'm going to be a little repetitive here, but I think it's you need to have the first customer, whether it's yourself, right, first system, and ergo customer. That's the most important thing. I, I meet with a lot of people who go like, okay, we got, we got this great component, right, and we, we can do this component, and it could be used for multiple things. Uh, what do I do, right? I hear that a lot. Uh, that's not going to get you very far. Um, you, may, you may have developed a, a repeater or a memory or whatever that's actually really good, but unless you have a use case, a customer, a system to put it into. So, you know, it's really engaging, you know, engaging with, okay, where does this end up? And where does ultimately this generate revenues, right? And maybe it's with the QC system, right? Maybe it's with data security, right? And I think that's the biggest guidance is, okay, that's great. You've, you've kind of invented something that's great and it has great performance. And we know theoretically uh, it can be part of a system uh, that could deliver. Uh, that's not good enough, right? You need, to, you need to have, you need to actually kind of know where it could be like the first deployment uh, that could be, you know, first real someone buying it as, as part of a solution for, for some uh, use case. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for a really uh, engaging talk. Thanks.